The Sega Ages 2500 series on the PlayStation 2 was so full of potential when it was first announced. After leaving console manufacturing, Sega suddenly had this huge audience of Nintendo and Sony fans who wouldn't have been caught dead with the Sega system previously. Remaking some of their greatest hits in full 3D was a fantastic idea on paper. Sega had a rich history full of incredible RPGs, fighters, racers, brawlers, you name it. The budget-conscious releases consisted of 33 volumes of important touchstones, as well as a smattering of more obscure but equally impressive titles from Sega's history. It was the perfect way to get non-fans up to speed with all things Sega. I previously looked at the first 10 volumes of this mostly middling, sometimes great, and occasionally tragic experiment. So let's continue on and see if things look up, or if we're going to have our face in our hands just overcome with disappointment once again. The first 10 volumes of the Sega Ages series has been mostly disappointing with the occasional bright spot. Many of those which were thanks to me not having spent a lot of time with the original versions, like Game Ground, a game that was a hard sell in screenshots, but once I actually spent some time with it, hey, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, I gotta mention at the start of each of these episodes, the games featured in this episode are intermittently available in different regions. They were released individually in Japan, but since they were mostly all on CD-ROM discs, Sega was able to localize and compile a bunch of them onto a single DVD disc called the Sega Classics Collection. You've probably seen this in a budget bin at some point. Alright, let's get on with the next batch of games. Hokuto no Ken, or as we know in North America, Fist of the North Star has a long and fairly unremarkable history in video game form. The manga and anime are among the most popular of all time in Japan, selling a ridiculous amount across a variety of mediums. I'm sure it's beloved for a number of reasons, but I feel like the wanton violence has got to be one of the biggest draws for it. I mean, the dude punches people, and they explode. That is certainly the most memorable aspect to me. The first experience that I had with Fist of the North Star was thanks to a heavily edited for TV version. Because, well, exploding heads and all that. Little did I know that I'd actually been playing games tied to the series much earlier, thanks to Sega making games based on it, and completely removing any references to it in the US. The overarching story of Fist of the North Star is sprawling and goes back decades. And I'm only really familiar with the early story, which was focused on martial arts expert Kenshiro's journey across a Mad Max-inspired wasteland on a quest for revenge. Sega's first game on the series was simply called Hakuto no Ken on the Mark III, or Sega Master System. <laughs> Programmed by future Balan Wonderworld director Yuji Naka, Hakuto no Ken is a solid belt scroller that was elevated by just how awesome it looked when enemies blast to pieces when you hit them. The US port called Black Belt basically changed all of the graphics as well as some of the bosses. It's also a bit easier thanks to more generously delivered health recovery items and power-ups. The follow-up on the Sega Mega Drive has similar gameplay but adds in a world map and sprinkles in some story for a much larger experience. The giant character sprites are detailed and make for a great showpiece on the hardware. Later released as Last Battle alongside the Genesis at launch, this version removed the ultra-violence of the Japanese version, where enemies just now fly off the screen when you hit them versus their heads and bodies exploding into blood geysers. Other than that, sprites were mostly unchanged. However, the total replacement of the North Star narrative means that it's absolute nonsense from the start. However, the unrelenting difficulty meant that I never saw very far, so maybe it gets better later on. The Sega Ages 2500 release is a remake of that original Mark III version, but even calling it that is quite a stretch because it's mostly an entirely different game. Sure, it's still a belt scroller in the vein of Kung Fu slash Spartan X, 
but instead of maintaining a constant forward progression, the game will guide you either left or right at different points during each level, which gives the impression of battling inside of a giant arena. Much of the gameplay has been embellished to add elements of the manga, movies, and show. Kenshiro's moveset is significantly more robust, with a normal and strong punch serving as the bedrock of which everything else is built upon. Kicking isn't nearly as big of a deal here as it was in the original. Pressing both attack buttons at the same time lets you do a roundhouse kick, or double tap in the direction and press the weak attack button for a flying kick. Rapidly tapping attack will trigger his trademark 100 hand punch move, complete with the expected yell. <laughs> The real meat of the gameplay enhancements come from these special moves. These are listed along the bottom of the screen and require your 7 point constellation meter to be filled to various levels before you can let them fly. Another meter underneath your health bar is for your fighting spirit. Hit square and Ken's aura ignites and he can block attacks. The one on one fights with bosses make a return here, but they're presented with some cinematic flair this time. Occasionally, you'll get caught up in a 100 hand punch face off, where you'll need to mash the button to come out on top. Some boss fights even consist of multiple foes, and in that case, the camera will fly to different areas of the arena to set the stage for each fight. Finish off a boss with a power move for that special flourish. <laughs> Diverging from the original, the story will sidestep to other characters and let you play as them. Rei and Toki play the same as Kenshiro, but the former has his own special moves. After completing these stages, Kenshiro's moveset will expand by one, reflecting that he learned something from these characters. The cel shaded graphics fit the characters in the world they inhabit, and in a weird turn of events, the typical level of jank that we've come to expect from the Sega Ages 2500 series works in its favor. Considering that the way the enemies would explode when you hit them was a graphical highlight of the original, I was pretty disappointed that the death animation is fairly subdued in the remake. In fact, enemies only seem to fly to pieces when you play as Rey, and even that isn't nearly as visceral as the classic version. So Volume 11 marks the first time the original version is included as a bonus. I wish that they'd done this much sooner. It would have been awesome to have the arcade versions of Golden Axe, Space Harrier, and Afterburner 2 with those games. Still, this is a surprisingly good emulation. It's displayed at a native 240p, and there's no softening filters foisted upon us, which, considering the time that this was released, is a pretty big win, if you ask me. So, Hakuto no Ken? Pretty decent, I guess. The original game was awesome, but I'm not sure if I'd consider it a defining part of Sega's history. Honestly, it's the unexpected inclusion of games like Hokuto no Ken that make the Sega Ages 2500 series so interesting. It helps give us a wider view of Sega's tapestry of games that aren't just the first Sonic the Hedgehog again. Next is something that I've actually been sort of dreading taking on since I first started this series like 500 years ago. Volume 12 is Poyo Poyo Su Perfect Set. And that entire series is so huge and segmented that the idea of trying to sum it all up just kind of stresses me out. There is a million of these things out there. Seriously, this series might be more confusing than Wonder Boy, and that's saying something. The rules of Poyo Poyo are pretty simple, and if you've ever played any falling block puzzler, I'm sure you can figure it out. Just match up four or more of the same colored gummies, jellies, or whatever you want to call them, and they'll disappear try to create a combo for a higher score. Poyo Poyo was originally created by Compile and first released on the MSX and Famicom Disk System in 1991 before making its first appearance on the Sega Mega Drive a year later. That game was brought to the US as Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Over the course of the 90s, Poyo Poyo appeared on a number of different platforms before Sega bought up the rights for it in 1998. The last entry that Compile developed was on the Sega Dreamcast and from there, Sonic Team took the reins. Today, Poyo Poyo is still going strong with Tetris crossovers and stuff like that. Poyo Poyo games tend to be more focused on player versus player battles compared to player versus 
uh, environment, I guess, like Tetris. As such, there's a whole big story mode with an ever-expanding cast of characters. The only one that I know is Arl, the main protagonist of the series. She is popular enough to have gotten her own Sega Gals Gachapon. 1994's Poyo Poyo Su seems to be the most popular of the classic compile developed versions, and has appeared on a bunch of different platforms like the Genesis Mini and the Nintendo Switch Sega Ages releases. So what did this version do in 2004 that Sega felt comfortable enough to call it perfect? Well, the idea behind the perfect set is that it uh, compiles all the different sets of rules and features from various versions of Sue, from the arcade to the Sega Saturn. I'm sure that there's plenty enough here to make fans of the original game pretty happy. Off the bat, you're treated to a recreation of the original opening, but with higher resolution artwork. It's pretty nice, and actually, from the character artwork to the cutscenes, all the redone artwork has been done in a way that's respectful to the original style. The main modes available are Story Mode, which is the classic Arl journey across the land battling different creatures who truly believe that the biggest disagreement can be solved with a simple game of Poyo. Actually, <laughs> I'm not even sure if that's the truth, but let's just pretend, okay? There's a regular two-player mode, so you can solve even the biggest disagreements in real life with a simple game of Poyo Poyo. Or you can just call up your best buds and face off with each other to see who's the best Poyo Poyo player in your closely knit group of friends. Puzzle mode is where you have to solve certain problems by lining up your jellies in different orders or configurations to clear the stage. It's probably not that hard, but the language barrier prevents me from proceeding all that far. I think you can even make your own puzzles here to share with your friends. Finally, there's a pretty robust list of options where you can engage and disengage various rules if you have a specific playstyle that you prefer. You can also swap out the remix soundtrack of this version for the arcade version. I'm surprised there wasn't a Mega Drive option here though. I'm sorry everybody, I'm really, really out of my depth with this Poyo Poyo stuff. Seriously, any of the combos that you've seen in the gameplay here probably wasn't intended, or was pure luck, or just a straight up accident. So with that, let's switch off to something that's a bit more within my wheelhouse. Some of my most vivid arcade going memories of my youth are totally fixated on Yu Suzuki's super scalar games, Space Harrier, Afterburner 2, and of course, OutRun. There was just something so technologically advanced about them that if I noticed one of them in my vicinity, I'd be inexplicably drawn to it. I would probably suggest that OutRun was probably the only racing game I even liked until, I don't know, uh, until OutRun 2. Still, it was these specific games that made my choice of a Sega Master System over an NES as my home console of choice easy. Space Harrier was more than enough for me on the SMS. OutRun was slightly better at home in my mind than Afterburner, even though it never even came close to that arcade feeling for me. The 1991 Genesis port was a marked improvement in every way. Although it skipped the 32X, OutRun achieved arcade perfection on the Sega Saturn. Actually, that version even had a 60 frames per second mode, which elevated it even further. OutRun was clearly a defining game in Sega's history and it was a foregone conclusion that it'd eventually make an appearance in the Sega Asia 2500 series. Problem is, the Super Scalar remakes haven't been what I'd consider great. OutRun keeps the tradition alive and is wholly unremarkable. Considering that it was once again Sims developing, this is hardly surprising. From the second you pull away from the starting line, it's immediately apparent that this doesn't even come close to the original at all. The car seems to have very little weight to it, and it glides across the road in a way that makes it feel like it's not even part of the world that it inhabits. 
You can tweak the cornering settings, which give it a little bit more weight, but it's ultimately for nothing. And it's certainly not a looker either. Yes, this is a budget game and it lives up to that expectation, but it might be the most boring looking version of OutRun ever created. There's almost no character to the supposedly superior 3D graphics. More egregious is that this was released around the same time frame as OutRun 2 arrived in the arcade and at home on the Xbox. Coast to Coast 2006 was still two years off on the PS2. So this is what OutRun fans had to live with, at least for a little while. On the flip side, you'd have to work exceptionally hard to screw up the audio. It wouldn't be OutRun without Splash Wave, Magical Sound Shower, and Passing Breeze. And this remake includes the arcade versions of the tunes, as well as the arranged version of each, which are actually much better than I expected. So you got arcade mode, which mirrors the original. Hop in your convertible and just blast through five stages. New to this version is arrange mode, which has some new levels, and the entire race is now made up of seven levels instead of five. The progression moves in a diamond-like shape, so you'll always start and finish on the same level no matter which direction you choose throughout. You'll also face off against rivals in this mode, but this aspect is pretty negligible in the scheme of things. Congratulations! OutRun is the last full-on remake of a superscalar game in the 2500 series. And I think it's safe to say that none of them had a single aspect that provided a superior experience than just emulating the original arcade games. Thankfully, Sega themselves realized this was the case too. But that is a story for another day. Next up, the often forgotten System 16 game, Alien Syndrome. When James Cameron's incredible follow-up to Alien arrived in theaters in 1986, it was easy to predict the influence it would have on a variety of entertainment mediums for the foreseeable future. Among those was Sega's System 16 overhead search and destroy arcade game, Alien Syndrome. Alien Syndrome is one of those games that I've never even seen in an arcade in my life. And I only knew about it because of the Sega Master System version, which wasn't exactly my favorite game ever. As we creep up on the midway point of the 2500 series, a nice little run and gun is exactly the kind of thing that we needed right now. And it can't help but feel more refreshing than it actually is. The time bomb is set. The premise is ultra basic. You play as either Ricky or Marie, a couple of space marines who have been tasked with rescuing the inhabitants of different space stations who have been captured by some alien creatures. Upon arriving, they plant a time bomb, and you'll have that breathing down your neck the entire time. There's generally plenty of time to rescue the hostages, although it's the bosses at the end of each level that you should really worry the most about. Like the arcade version, you can play with two players simultaneously. Each will use a variety of weapons to stave off the alien creatures. Weapons like lasers, flamethrowers, and fireballs make up the vast majority of your arsenal, although you'll pick up a couple of options in each area that will back you up. These shoot behind you, which is necessary for crowd control. But in a new addition to this remake, you can sacrifice each option for a screen-clearing smart bomb style attack. The biggest evolution here is the dual analog controls to move and shoot simultaneously. Well, this might not seem like a big deal now, this style of control wasn't all that common in 2004 when this was made and it truly helps the game feel incredibly modern and playable today. The original was surprisingly bright with pastel colors, but the visuals are suitably muddy in this remake. Like Hokuto no Ken, it actually works in this game's favor, but I just wish it wasn't so dark all the time. You might find yourself falling into pits and losing a life because it's not even apparent that there was a pit in front of you. I never felt that the arcade game had any real identifiable music theme, and it was mostly just made up of atmospheric beats and drones. That remains the case here, and I wouldn't say that there's anything notable about the music at all. 
Alien Syndrome was soft rebooted just a couple of years later on the PlayStation Portable and the Nintendo Wii with a sequel that takes place around 100 years after this game. I have to say, after trying that out for a little bit, I think that this remake is much better than that game. Next, we got something that might be a mixed bag for some people. It's the Catholic Collection. Yep, <laughs> the Catholic Collection. I don't know, when I hear that name, I'm just immediately uninterested. But, you know, I have no idea what the general consensus is on these games among certain Sega fans. Maybe it's a beloved series. Who knows? So let's find out. On your mark. Get set. So what exactly is this collection? Well, the Catholic Collection gathers three of Sega's Olympic-style sports games under one banner. We obviously have Decathlete, Winter Heat, and Virtua Athlete. The first two were released in arcades in 1996 and 97 on the Sega Titan hardware, and later ported to the Sega Saturn. Virtua Athlete was released in arcades on the Sega Naomi board, and brought home to the Dreamcast shortly after as Virtua Athlete 2000, which actually makes it the newest game in the Sega Ages 2500 series. As a standalone, these wouldn't have been something that I'd be interested in at all, but together as one cohesive game? Now that, I can get into. Even though this is billed as a collection, the way that it's presented is really more of a compilation of 28 events, even if the events of Virtua Athlete are more or less remakes of those in Decathlete. You can choose to play each game's selection of sports either grouped together like the original versions, or freely play each competition on their own. You can even create your own competition made up of any combination of events from all three games. So it's pretty complete. If you've ever played any sort of track and field type game, you know there's one thing you can count on. Button mashing. But, you know, there's something strangely nostalgic about playing the events in Decathlete Classic. <laughs> and hey, if you want to play with some friends, bust out the multi-tap. Each event ranges from simply pressing one or two buttons as fast as possible to slightly more complex, where you need to time analog stick or D-pad presses. Thankfully, every event shows you how to play it before you have a go at it. Still, this is absolutely an example of practice makes perfect. You're likely going to fail at most of these events in the most embarrassing way early on. But just keep at it, and suddenly you'll be setting records. Since this is considered one game, certain aspects have been streamlined to create a standard look. Gone are the portraits for each character on the select screen, resulting in a more generic presentation. Although, thankfully, this artwork does appear on the results screen. While the game certainly doesn't look bad, I can't help but feel that the character models look quite a bit better on the Dreamcast version of Virtua Athlete 2000. Everything seems more bright and vivid in that game. Although, I don't know, that could just as easily come down to the video signal being used. I can't stop looking at these photographers in the background. Uh, it shouldn't be as funny as it is. Thankfully, the game never seems to dip under 60 frames per second, and nor should it. There's not a whole lot here that seems like it would push the hardware in ways it's not comfortable in going. I know what you're thinking. It's been three years since you last did one of these Sega Ages videos, and you're gonna end it with the Catholic Collection? Well, you know what? You're right. Let's go for one more. Let's check out Volume 16, Virtua Fighter 2. One-on-one -on -one fighting was the game genre that defined the early 1990s. Street Fighter 2 was a worldwide phenomenon, and Mortal Kombat only pushed it to new heights of popularity. As soon as the tech was there, boundaries would be pushed and the game would change. Who better to lead that charge than Yu Suzuki? Virtua Fighter would go on to be Sega's flagship fighting game and have a long and storied history, continuing even today. I'm not sure which entry is considered to be the most popular, but Virtua Fighter 2 is likely the most influential. So its place in Sega's pantheon is assured, 
and we have our first one-on-one -on -one fighting game of the entire Sega Ages 2500 series. What sets this game apart from previous releases is that this is the first time that the original developer decided to step in and make sure that the remake is done right. And is just as so, since I can't imagine anyone other than AM2 being able to get the subtleties of Virtua Fighter correct. There was one major obstacle. Apparently, the source code for Virtua Fighter 2 was lost, making it even more important for AM2 to step in themselves. Their solution was to build the Sega Ages 2500 version from the arcade game which leads to some pretty interesting differences from the previous home versions. It's since been equaled and surpassed by ports to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, as well as the versions included in the Yakuza games. Of course, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not only very good at VF2, but I'm not very well versed in the nuances of Virtua Fighter's gameplay in general. So this port includes version 2 and version 2.1 for completion's sake. The differences between the two largely come down to move tweaks and rebalances that <laughs> I'm nowhere near skilled enough to be able to demonstrate for you. Imagine losing to this bozo! Visually, it's pretty reminiscent of Virtua Racing, meaning that the colors look strangely muted and dark. It's almost like it has a haze over the whole thing and the contrast seems to be jacked up. Still, I wouldn't say that it looks bad by any means. Just different is all. More importantly, it has all the graphical flourishes that just weren't possible on less powerful hardware. This is most apparent in Shun stage, with the fight taking place on a raft going downstream. In previous versions, this was a static location, but it was restored to its arcade glory on PS2. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of VF2 on the PS2 is that it does not run at 60 frames per second. Immediately, you're thinking, well, why would this be a good thing? Wouldn't that automatically make it inferior to the Saturn port? Well, if arcade accuracy is what you're looking for, then you'll be happy to know that this version runs at the same 57.5 frames per second as the arcade game. The only downfall is that this causes the occasional judder in the frame rate. But in the heat of battle, this is pretty much invisible unless you're really, really looking for it. The main disappointment that fans will have with this version is the generally bare bones presentation and it's pretty feature sparse. You've got basic arcade mode, a versus mode, and a ranking mode. The first two are pretty self-explanatory, but ranking grades you based on how well you do on one credit. There's a couple of random options of interest, specifically those for BGM mode and screen. The former lets you choose between the arcade original music or arranged music from the Saturn version. Screen mode lets you slightly zoom the image to fill out the screen. In its original form, it was slightly letterboxed. You can use the screen mode to fill out the vertical space of the image if that bothers you. Although Virtua Fighter 2 is not perfect and is pretty light on bonus features, I absolutely commend the amount of work that went into a supposed budget game. I just wish I was better at it. Ora, ora, ora! There was some incredible mediocrity going on with this batch of games. If I had to pick a clear winner this time around, I probably have to hand it to Virtua Fighter 2, even though I can't remember the last time I was spanked that hard by a fighting game. I even tried stacking the deck heavily in my favor by putting the game on easy and setting the match time to 15 seconds, and it still <laughs> took me over an hour to beat arcade mode. I mean, I've always been more of a Street Fighter fan, but that's pretty embarrassing. Anyway, creeping forward, inch by inch, I promise you that we're getting close to some good games. But next time around, we'll be starting with Fancy Star Generation 2. And that one obviously has me curious.